Public employee pensions have been front and center in the ongoing Stockton bankruptcy case, drawing national attention. But cities like Stockton aren't the only governmental bodies grappling with paying for promises made to employees. The state of California has its own issues. Has the recent upsurge in the stock market fixed the problem for public employee pension funds? Or does more need to be done? We'll talk to Ryan Miller, an expert on public employee pensions with the Nonpartisan Legislative Analyst's Office, and John Ortiz, who writes the Sacramento Bee's State Worker Blog, one of the state capital's most authoritative reporters on public employee issues. Public employee pensions, exactly how defined is the benefit? Additional funding for the Matty Report made possible by a grant from Paramount Agricultural Companies, growing healthy food for you and your family. From the California Channel at the State Capitol, Valley PBS, and the Matty Institute, it's the Matty Report with Executive Director of the Matty Institute, Mark Kepler. Welcome. In 2012, California enacted pension reform. Most of the reforms focused on new rather than current public employees. So how have those reforms fared? Our guest is Ryan Miller from the Nonpartisan Legislative Analyst Office, and he's here to tell us about what happened. Um, welcome to the Matter Report. Thanks for having me. Uh, okay, so CalPERS, uh, the big public employee pension fund, what is its current unfunded liabilities? Well, CalPERS administers retirement programs both for the state but also for local governments. Mm -hmm. The total for all of those groups is about $100 billion. Uh, the state, including CSU employees, makes up about half of that, or around $50 billion. So $100 billion, just to put it in, in perspective, is that's about the size of the state budget, right? Yeah, though those are liabilities that were accrued over time, whereas the state budget is sort of an annual figure. An annual thing. Okay, I'm just trying to put it in some context. But yeah, that's right. The state budget, around $110 billion. Okay, so um, let's talk about the legislation that was enacted uh, to address the problem. What changes were made? Well, in 2012, uh, the legislature and governor passed a bill commonly referred to as PEPRA, uh, made a number of changes to public employee pension policy. For example, uh, employees who started after January 2013 will have to work a little bit longer, a few years longer to, to enjoy the same level of pension benefits uh, as employees that were hired before that date. Uh, it also addressed some practices that were criticized by some, uh, for example, spiking, uh, whereby employees would uh, uh, earn higher salaries at the end of their career, would sort of ratchet up their payments. So just life. to be clear about that, the way the pension system works, uh, typical defined, it's called defined benefit plan, which is traditional pension, mm -hmm. is they base it on your, high, well, a lot of, in private sectors, last three years, mm -hmm. but in, in California, it's your last highest, or not your last, your highest salary. Yeah, it's the last 12 months, but that was changed, so for employees who start after that date, it's the last three years. Uh, right, for new yeah, employees, but, yeah. but for, mm -hmm. for current employees. So it varies per group, yeah. Right. Uh, another important change was that uh, it established a goal for all public employees to pay for half of the normal costs of their pensions, which is sort of the annual cost of the pension benefits they earn in a year. Uh, most state employees already pay that much, uh, but it will affect some groups. For example, judges will have to pay more. Well, the normal cost, though, is not the same as the total cost because there's unfunded liability from previous generations. So what you're saying mm -hmm. is, current employees are going to pay their cost yeah. for their pension. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what about uh, the anticipated savings? How much money do they think this, that these changes were going to save the state and local governments? CalPERS estimates that the uh, savings will range between $42 billion and $55 billion over the next 30 years. Now, the savings would start out to be pretty modest, but as these PEPRA employees make up a larger percent of the uh, public employee workforce, it'll grow to be quite substantial. So as, as the new employees come in under the new system uh, with you know, a little tighter rules, mm -hmm. um, it's going to have a more a greater effect. So over time, it's going to get bigger. That's right. Okay. Um, so CalPERS recently changed some of its assumptions regarding um, uh, the increase in, in cost to governments for, the, for, these fund, uh, for the funding these pensions. What are these changes, and aren't these changes then going to increase liability? Uh, it's going to make it even greater for local governments. Well, it's going to it's going to increase the cost uh, for local government for state and local governments. Uh, for example, in the spring, uh, you know, CalPERS uh, conducts these periodic what they call uh, experience studies uh, that looks at uh, the assumptions that they make about mortality and a host of other things. Uh, and compares it to observations that they make in their population to determine whether they're still appropriate. Uh, in the spring, they revisited the mortality assumption, uh, in particular for men who appear to be uh, living longer. That's good news. Yeah, <laughs> it's good news <laughs> for us. Um, but this will affect uh, certain pools that are predominantly male, like, say, uh, highway patrol officers, uh, and it will also affect that group because uh, patrol officers tend to retire earlier in life 
Uh, so if they live longer, that really increases the cost of their pension benefit. They tend to be male and they tend to live longer. So mm -hmm. there you go. Um, so the market, we got, we're dealing with the market, you know, CalPERS invest the money. The market goes up and down. And the last few years, frankly, we've had a pretty good market. Uh, mm -hmm. And notwithstanding some of, the, some of the ups and downs that, that have happened recently, are those recent market gains reducing the size of the unfunded liabilities with CalPERS? Yeah, so there's a couple things going on. I mean, it'll definitely reduce the size of those unfunded liabilities compared to if they were just uh, at the average return. Uh, but at the same time, these mortality assumptions combined with other changes they've made recently to uh, kind of shorten the period of time over which we pay for these liabilities, we expect those changes are going to continue to increase state and local contributions. But these gains will certainly soften the blow. So kind of two steps forward, one step back. In a way, it's, it's complex. Yeah. It's There's a lot okay. going on. I'm trying know. to make it simple. Sure, sure. Um, you know, what about the discount rate? That's the percentage increase that CalPERS assumes it's going to make on its investments. I mean, right now, I think it's 7.5%. Mm -hmm. Is that number realistic? Yeah, so actually CalPERS and CalSTRS as well have both brought that number down in recent years to reflect some of the huge losses that they recognized in the late 2000s. Um, the number now, 7.5, appears in line with historical uh, averages. It also uh, is appropriate, we think, given the asset mix that the pension system has. Um, that said, uh, you know, this, the, there's a substantial risk, though, that, that these uh, investment returns might not meet that assumption in the longer run. And uh, the legislature and, and the state's elected leaders need to be aware of that. Um, and it's one of the reasons that our office has urged caution in adopting new uh, spending programs and, and uh, has, when we've urged uh, paying down these debts uh, as quickly as possible. I think the term is fiscally prudent. Um, you'd probably agree with that. Well, up next, we're going to talk about the other big public employee pension fund, CalSTRS, the one set up for teachers. That conversation in a moment. This is the Natty Report. Welcome back. We're talking with Ryan Miller, a pension expert with the Nonpartisan Legislative Analyst Office. CalSTRS is the Teachers Retirement Fund, and it's had its own uh, share of issues. Over the past few years, your office has called attention to the CalSTRS funding problem. Just how big a problem is it? Well, the latest estimates uh, have the unfunded liability at about $74 billion. Um, an important distinction there was that uh, CalSTRS didn't have the authority to increase rates and kind of address this problem. It was something that the legislature and governor had to do, and, and it was a plan that they enacted in the budget last year. So CalPERS, they can change it. Their board can change uh, some of that, some of those rules. That's right. They can increase employer rates. So say the state will have to pay more when when the market comes down, but CalSTRS didn't have that ability. CalSTRS, the legislature has to make that decision, and mm -hmm. of course, it's a teacher situation, and there's lots of teachers, and so politically, it might be challenging to change some of those rules. Is that certainly a, a difficult assumption? decision? It's a lot of money, and so it, it's uh, they're difficult decisions. Okay, um, so recently there was an attempt to get a handle on the problem. What exactly did the legislature do then? So in the in the budget plan this year, uh, the legislature and governor enacted a plan to address this problem over the next 32 years. Uh, the the school districts will pay around 70 percent of the costs. The state will pay around 20, and then the teachers the remaining 10. Uh, I think a, a noteworthy uh, part of this, uh, you know, under California case law, uh, you can't increase the contributions of existing employees. Uh, but this plan does so by essentially guaranteeing or vesting, as it's called in pension policy, uh, a benefit the teachers receive uh, that adjust their pensions upward by 2% a year in retirement. Uh, they weren't guaranteed that before. They are now. And so the legislature and governor were, asked, were able to ask them to pay a little bit of this, uh, of this funding plan. Because under law, there has to be this thing called an offsetting advantage. That's right. And yeah. so this is the offsetting advantage. They're That's allowed right, then yeah. to make these changes. And uh, it's a little bit different for, as we talked about Pepper in the last segment, it's a little bit different for teachers that were hired before 2013 and after 2013, but that's the gist of it, yeah. Okay. Um, so we were talking before about the recent gains in the stock market um, and how it affects un un unfunded liability. It drives it down a little bit. But, you know, the market has downturns, too. It goes up, it goes down. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that more likely than not? And so is that, is that unfunded liability really taken care of by an up market? Well, and so, yeah, that's obviously a concern. Uh, as we discussed, CalSTRS didn't have the ability to change these rates. Now, for the, for the school district rates and for the state rates, uh, part of this funding plan gives CalSTRS some limited authority within some bounds, but to adjust that and try to keep the plan on track. Uh, so hopefully that'll uh, help keep it on track if there are 
in addition to just the big downturns, also if there's a big you know boom market, um, you know state and, and school district rates will decrease slightly in the in that case as well. Okay, so the legislation and the governor have have taken some steps to deal with uh, public employee pensions, mm -hmm. um, but that's not all there is. Uh, there's also public employee re retiree health insurance. Um, what's the outstanding liability there? Yeah, so the state provides retiree health and dental benefits to its employees and, and CSU employees as well. The, la the latest estimate for that is about $65 billion. Okay, um, so is there money being set aside to deal with that liability? So whereas for pension benefits, uh, the way the state funds those is that it, it pays for them uh, during the employees' working years. Uh, we set aside money, we invest it, and we use the investment returns uh, decades later to pay for part of the cost of the benefit. We don't do that for retiree health benefits, uh, and as a result, it's a much more costly way to pay for it. So it's a it's a pay as you go. It's a system. pay as you go. System. So in, yeah. under under like the public employee pensions, we're using some of that interest uh, or the investments uh, mm -hmm. returns and that money to pay down the cost. Mm -hmm. But with retiree health, no. That's right. Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, so what are the LAO's suggestions uh, on addressing the outstanding long-term liability with public employee uh, health insurance? Uh, well, for a while, we've suggested uh, that the state gradually move to a plan where we fully fund, uh, we pre-fund retiree health benefits just like we do for pension benefits. Um, it's, it's, it would be costly. Uh, the latest estimates are almost $2 billion a year in addition to what we pay already. But while it would increase our costs in the near term, the very long-term savings over the next few decades would be substantially lower. So pay me now or pay me a lot more later. That's essentially how it works in <laughs> okay. pension policy. Yeah. All right. Well, I want to thank Ryan Miller with the Legislative Analyst Office for joining us. Up next, Sacramento's most knowledgeable observer on public employee issues. That's the Sacramento Bee's John Ortiz. That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. We're now joined by John Ortiz, who writes the Sacramento Bee's State Worker, State Worker blog. That's a must-read for anyone who wants to be up to date on public employee issues in California. Welcome back to the Maddie Report. Thanks for having me. So, um, Stockton, uh, they've got some uh, pension issues over there that have had national news implications. Uh, can you briefly summarize the Stockton situation? Well, uh, Stockton is bankrupt, and it's now struggling to figure out how much to pay its creditors. It's going to offer a plan to do that. And uh, it's upside down for a number of reasons, not the least of which is uh, its pension obligations. So my understanding is uh, they've settled with most of their creditors except for the Franklin Templeton Fund. I guess they owe them $32 million and they don't want That's to pay right. the $32 million. That's right. It's so uh, anything else you want to want to add to that in terms of where's the bankruptcy judge on this, by the way? At, at well, what he has said is that pensions can be touched by bankruptcy, which is a significant finding uh, because it's been thought that pensions were ironclad, that the promises couldn't be broken once made. The bankrupt, the, the judge has said from the court, Judge Klein, from the bench, he said they can be broken. That's what bankruptcy is all about. Uh, it's just one more obligation. It's one more obligation. And now they're going to offer a plan apparently that will not include breaking their pension obligations, uh, which will create an interesting situation legally. Yeah, I guess we'll see. Um, well, isn't Stockton's, part of Stockton's problem is they were a little generous in their benefits, particularly to public safety, police and fire. Yeah, that's right. And uh, this is true uh, across the spectrum that in terms of pension obligations, you'll see uh, your, your police and fire have some of the, the best benefits. For example, uh, somebody who worked for 20 years, retired at 50, and had an eighty thousand dollar salary when they left if they live for thirty years their pension would be about one point two million total mm -hmm. before cost of living so you can wind up in si with situations and do where somebody makes more as a pensioner than they did when they were working i was actually looking at statistics and they said that uh... the pension the average pension for hundred and twelve stockton police and fire employees who retired uh... in the last uh, five years was eighty over eighty eight thousand compared to 70,000 uh, for the 490 Sacramento police and fire uh, that have re retired uh, in that same time. So uh, anyway, some interesting numbers. Some argue, though, that uh, Stockton's pension obligations um, really are problematic because they take a bigger and bigger cut out of the general fund for the city, which means fewer parks, uh, streets uh, aren't being maintained, and, and less police and fire. Uh, 
The city, on the other hand, says, no, we, got, we have to maintain these pensions because if we don't, um, we're going to have a mass exodus of existing employees, and we're not going to be able to get new employees. Um, right. Now, you wrote recently about a, a Boston College study that found a link between the quality of the pension plan and the quality of employees. What did they find? What they found was that when people leave the private sector and go into government, they generally uh, earn 7% less. Uh, and, and so what, what they said was that there's a quality gap of employees, assuming that the best employees make the most money, there's a gap in the quality of employees between government and the private sector. But if the pension plan is better, that gap narrows. They concluded that you're in trouble if you cut pensions too deeply because you're going to affect the quality of your workforce. So some support for the Stockton argument. Um, uh, bankruptcy. The bankruptcy judge um, is still to rule on, on the Stockton plan uh, coming out of bankruptcy. But isn't the key question there whether Stockton is pre presenting a plan that's going to restore the city to solvency and it's not going to relapse into a second bankruptcy? Well, yes, that, that's absolutely right. Vallejo uh, entered into bankruptcy and emerged in 2011 and did not touch its pension obligations. It's now facing the distinct possibility it could have to file for bankruptcy again. So the bankruptcy judge in Stockton is probably looking at Vallejo. And he has said that. From, he has said that he's very mindful that he doesn't want to see this come back around in a few years. Mm -hmm. um, so let's say he approves the plan. Um, all his comments about the bankruptcy law you know, supersedes any other rights regarding pensions, don't they become kind of moot? They do from a legal standpoint. They don't carry any legal weight. I think, though, that this is another step in changing the dynamic of public pensions. I think this is another warning shot to unions that the golden goose can be killed, that that notion that pensions can't be changed no matter what is probably flawed. And that could affect, I think, down the road negotiations for salary and benefits. Okay, what about, so let's t take a look at, at, at local, uh, other cities. Um, you've got Vallejo, you've got San Bernardino. Um, what are local governments doing to kind of address this problem? Well, we've seen in Ventura uh, County recently there was a measure that the court stopped because they said it was illegal. It was going to try to pull new employees out of the pension system altogether and give them a defined contribution. A 401k a type 401k plan. A 401k type of uh, plan. Um, but I think right now the atmospherics are just not there to, to really move ahead with something significant. We've got state... Uh, the state plan's just not quite two years old uh, to, to lower pension promises, uh, and the economy's come back. All right, so, so the, the investments of, of CalPERS and others have gotten a little better, so the, the liability doesn't look as great. And voters' 401ks are looking better. Right, right. people are happier. Right. Okay, well, up next, what actions are being taken to improve or worsen the public employee pension situation? That conversation in a moment. This is the Maddie Report. Welcome back. We're talking with John Ortiz, who writes the Sacramento Bee's State Worker blog. So the public employee situation, is it getting better or worse? Um, one public pension uh, abuse that was targeted was something called spiking, where you inflate your salary uh, through promotions and other means to hike your retirement benefits. There was a report done by the state controller, John Chung, that indicated that CalPERS may not be adequately addressing the problem. What, what were his findings? Well, he said that... Uh the fund doesn't have enough staff to conduct uh, rigorous audits, that it's lax in checking for spiking. And for example, if they audited everybody in the system uh, at, at the rate that they do now, about 100 a year, it would take 66 years to get all the way through every employer. So highly unlikely that we're going to, well, Probably need more staffing. He might make a good point That's there. That's exactly um, right. Okay, so there also CalPERS recently voted 7 to 5 to count more than 100 kinds of supplemental and temporary pay towards calculating pensions. Governor Brown was not pleased with that. He's saying, listen, that undermines the pension reform that we passed two years ago. Is this a matter of two steps forward and one step back? Well, I know that the local government certainly thinks so because that's where you see a, a lot of this kind of abuse. Um, but CalPERS took the position that they're not mom and they don't make the locals eat their vegetables, and that the local governments have the power through better management at the bargaining table, they can limit this kind of stuff. 
Uh, and so that's kind of where it sits. Uh, the labor influenced CalPERS board, the members who are more leaning toward those interests, that's the position they took. And they're probably going to take the position that, listen, that's collective bargaining, negotiate the table. And so really right. the focus is on city management and, and county management to negotiate prudently for the on the employer side. Right. Um, okay, Supreme Court, the state Supreme Court also ruled recently that CalPERS can sue rating agencies over high ratings that they gave to investments that collapsed in 2007, 2008. And specifically, CalPERS has this $1.3 billion investment in 2006 on products that were rated, had the highest rating from Moody's right. and Standard & Poor's even though these products consisted largely of high-risk subprime mortgages. So what are the chances that CalPERS is going to win this battle? Well, I, you know, I think they're going to be like Franklin Templeton at Stockton, and they're going to wind up getting some pennies on the dollar. It, what I find interesting about this is that they still use Moody's for <laughs> approving, you know, that, that's one of the mm. seals of approval for their investments. So. Yeah, there's a lot of sound and fury, but I don't know that it signifies much here. Yeah, okay. Um, well, the other thing that uh, the LEO points out is besides public employee pensions, we've got this whole issue of public employee retiree health care. Um, and they're saying that's now the state's biggest liability. Do you foresee the legislature or the governor tackling this issue in the near future? I think the governor is very interested in this. He mentioned it very briefly in a debate that he had with the, his Republican uh, gubernatorial uh, rival, Neil Kashkari. He made a, a passing mention about uh, health benefits and wanting to bring down that cost. And I, I would not be surprised if you see this as a second term. He's done pensions. Now he's going to turn to health care. So health care, though, is the way I understand it is it's a pay-as-you-go system. Right. So there's no money set aside. Yes. And, and so isn't one of the big problems, we were talking about this in an earlier segment, one of the big problems is, at least with pensions, you put money aside and you can earn money on that money, which makes your liability yet less. That's not true in public employee health. Right. Health care. It's like paying interest only on your credit card. And the balance just keeps going up. Right. Uh, and that's why I think it need, he needs to uh, he needs to have that as a legacy agenda to tackle. And I think that is going to happen. Okay. Um, well, let's take a look at, at the local level. I mean, what's happening there at places like San Diego, San Jose? Uh, well, with regard to pensions, um, Ventura County had a measure. It was pulled back. Uh, Chuck Reed, of course, has been trying to push a statewide measure. He's no the Democratic luck there. mayor from San Jose. That's right. No luck there. Uh, and I just think that the atmospherics right now are, are not there. You've got court action with some of the stuff that's happened in San Jose and San Diego. And I think a lot of the local uh, efforts are just kind of sitting back right now to let the dust settle before they move ahead. Do you see, I mean, do you see things happening at the bargaining table? If nothing happens at the state legislature, you know, up here in Sacramento, what about at the bargaining table where public employers say, listen, we <clears> foresee <throat> our liability going, you know, getting greater. We're not going to be able to build or maintain parks. We're not going to be able to maintain right. streets. Right. Yeah, I think that pensions are, uh, and uh, those kinds of benefits are definitely going to get uh, harsher treatment at the bargaining table. I think the trade-off will be you're going to see a push for higher pay. Uh, if you shrink... Uh, retirement benefits, you have to make it up with pay. Now you've, you've, you've made the analogy of, of pay and benefits is really like a balloon. If you press on one side, it kind of comes out on the, on the other side. Yes. I mean, what about the governor's proposal uh, was a couple of years ago, I guess, on kind of a hybrid approach where you have like a 401k mm -hmm. plus a traditional pension equals like 70% of your salary in retirement. Mm -hmm. Does, is that going to get any traction maybe in the future? It might. Uh, I think that uh, there are some problems when you begin to introduce those kinds of formulas in because somebody has to administer those defined uh, contributions, and that can be expensive. You know, the argument is that defined benefits are cheaper to administer, but uh, if you're not paying as much on the front end and you don't have to pay as much on the back end, maybe it makes sense. Okay, well, I guess we'll see. Well, I want to thank John Ortiz from the Sacramento Bee State Worker Blog, as well as Ryan Miller from the Nonpartisan Legislative Analyst Office for joining us. If you want to stay current on state and local politics, you can sign up for our free e-newsletter, The Maddie Daily, by logging on to our website at maddieinstitute.org. And now, another perspective. The biggest debts owed by state and local governments in California aren't bonds to build schools or water systems. It's not even the money that they occasionally have to borrow from banks to cover their budget deficits. By far, the largest debts owed by state and local governments in California are what are called unfunded liabilities for pensions for public employees, 
both those already drawing pensions and those on the payroll and expected to draw pensions in the future. How big are those debts? Well, that's difficult to say because it all depends on what one assumes to be the rate of earnings on their pension fund investments in future years. The state and local pension funds tend to use a fairly high earnings assumption, about 7.5%, which is quite a bit higher than private pension plans use. And that has a tendency to kind of minimize the unfunded liability. That's the gap between what they have and what they'll need to pay out in the future. But even using that, that discount rate, as it's called, the, the debts are pretty enormous. Maybe on the order of a half a trillion dollars a year in California, when you count the state California Public Employees Retirement System, which is the largest pension trust fund in the country, the state teacher's retirement system, the retirement system for University of California employees, those for judges and legislators, and finally, the local systems that are operated independently. How much? A half a trillion dollars is a pretty good round number. In fact, state controller John Chung just issued a report saying that the liabilities, the unfunded liabilities for local pension plans have risen from $7 billion to almost $200 billion just in the last 10 years. Now, how are those debts going to be paid? Well, employees are being asked to pay more, and cities and counties are being asked to pay more, and employers, in fact, the bill for retirement has tripled or even quadrupled in some cities. It's the cities that get hit the hardest because they have a high percentage of their budgets devoted to payroll, particularly highly paid with high pensions, policemen and firemen. So what's to be done about this dilemma? Could they just have to pay more and more into the pension funds, thereby squeezing out other expenditures? Or is there a way to reform the system? The state legislature took a crack at it a year or two ago, and they did a very mild reform that may have some effects down the line, but a lot of folks think they need more radical surgery. What kind of surgery? Could you really affect the pensions of existing retirees or the pensions of those already promised to existing employees? Well, that's an issue that's being tested now in the courts. Three cities have been forced into bankruptcy in large measure because of their pension costs. And a bankruptcy judge in the Stockton case has ruled that pension debts are just another form of debt. They don't hold any kind of special status in the bankruptcy court, and they may be trimmed, if necessary, to achieve solvency in a bankrupt city. It's a very controversial decision. It's certainly to be tested up the line in the appellate courts. And it also mirrors a decision made in the Detroit's bankruptcy case as well. Pension debt is a big issue in California. It's going to continue to be a big issue, and truly no one knows how it will be resolved. The views expressed in the Maddie Report are those of the individuals participating in the program and do not necessarily reflect those of the Maddie Institute, the California Channel, Casey, or Valley PBS. If you'd like to share your thoughts about the points and opinions shared in the Maddie Report, visit our website at valleypbs.org. This is Mark Kepler for the Maddie Report. Thanks for joining us.